Hi there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is. Welcome to Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson. And for the next eh, half hour, I'm going to be talking about some things that I hope you'll find interesting. Um, as always, any comments, questions, reactions, whatever to the show should be sent to me directly. The email address is hoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. And uh, if you didn't catch that, you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time. Time. You can get the email address from there, or you can leave a comment there. If you do email me, please, uh, as always, uh, include something in the subject line to make it clear that this is not spam, and um, be a little patient about getting an answer, because I can be a little slow about email, but you will get an answer. All right, so let's get to it. First off, as whenever I, uh, whenever I can, I want to start with some good news. And uh, got a couple of bits of good news here. And the first one actually comes from a place where there hasn't been a whole lot of good news of late. The Supreme Court of the United States. In a 6-2 to two decision on Thursday, April 29th, the Supreme Court upheld an EPA regulation that requires Midwestern states uh, with coal-fired power plants to install technology uh, in order to reduce the harmful emissions that go downwind to the East Coast. This ruling could end a standoff among the states that has dated from 1990. But you see, 1990 was the year that the that Congress amended the Clean Air Act to strengthen the EPA's ability to deal with what's called cross-border pollution. Now, this all came about because East Coast states were complaining that they were having trouble meeting their targets for uh, reducing air pollution because of pollution that came to the East from plants in the Midwest. That is coal-fired plants in the Midwest were producing the pollution, but because of the prevailing winds, that pollution got moved from the Midwest to the East. Uh, the results were that the states that were producing the pollution were meeting their clean air standards because they didn't have to deal with all the pollution they generated, while other states are having trouble meeting theirs because they were dealing with pollution that they didn't even generate. So. In 1990, Congress gave the EPA more power to deal with this, but the result has been nearly 15 years of legal and political battles uh, over the agency's attempts to actually produce regulations to actually do this. The latest version of this, again, it's called cross-state uh, air pollution rule. Uh, the uh, when, most recent version of that was issued in 2011, and at that time the EPA uh, estimated that pollution carried downwind from coal-fired plants was causing about 400,000 asthma attacks per year and 34,000 premature deaths per year. But of course none of that mattered to the coal industry that didn't want to have to pay for any pollution control, nor did it matter to the uh, leaders of the um, provincial Midwestern states that were more interested in protecting their, their uh, internal corporations than they were about damaging the health of their fellow citizens. But now, with this Supreme Court decision, coal-fired plants in upwind states can be required to install pollution control, pollution reduction technology. And that fact has been cheered not only by environmentalists, not only by leaders of states on the East Coast, but also by public health groups such as the American Lung Association. Now, there are still more fights to come about this, partly because the EPA is now in the process of reducing the allowed standard for ozone, which is a heavy component in smog, uh, reducing the standard for ozone from 84 parts per billion to somewhere between 60 and 70 parts per billion. So there are still battles to come on this, but that doesn't change the fact that this decision, this is good news. Uh, and by the way, there's a footnote to this. The dissenting judges were, I expect to no one's surprise, Anthony Scalia and Clarence Thomas. Uh, in Scalia's dissent, he said the majority had trampled on the rights of the affected states. Now, Scalia calls himself an originalist. What this means is that in every decision, he tries to discern the original intent of the founding fathers. I wonder where in that original intent he found a right to undermine the health of tens of thousands of people. 
All right, next up under good news, something we should all keep an eye on if we want to at least keep the image of a functioning democracy in this country, is attempts to limit and restrict the right of people to vote through the use of, among other things, uh, voter ID laws. Uh, voter ID laws, which despite the claims that uh, uh, they do nothing, in fact, to prevent any kind of voter fraud, which is virtually non-existent, but what these laws do do is hinder the ability of especially the poor and minorities to vote, as they are the most likely to lack the required uh, documents. Well, some good news on that front. On Tuesday, April 29th, U.S. District Court Judge Lynn Edelman struck down Wisconsin's new voter ID law, finding that it unfairly burdened the poor and minorities. Uh, he also said in his ruling that the evidence at the trial indicated that in-person voter fraud, the only kind affected by voter photo ID laws, is virtually non-existent. The plaintiff in this case was an elderly woman named Ruth L. Frank. Uh, the elderly, by the way, being another group who are disproportionately impacted by these ID laws. Frank was born at home on uh, August 21st, 1927. Her mother recorded the birth in the family Bible. Frank still has that. A few months later, when she was baptized, her mother got a notarized certificate of baptism. Frank still has that. She also has a social security card, a Medicare statement, and a checkbook. What she doesn't have, because there never was one, is a birth certificate. And without that birth certificate, she couldn't get a state ID, so she would not be able to vote. She and several other plaintiffs, represented by the American Civil Liberties Union, joined the League of United Latin American Citizens in suing Governor Scott Walk All Over You in order to overturn the law and now they have won. Now this victory, I have to tell you, could be temporary. The state says it will appeal the ruling and appeals courts in this country, populated largely by well-off, comfortably situated people, so out of touch with social reality that they find it hard to imagine anyone could be without a photo ID because after all, you need one to get on a commercial air flight, don't you? These courts have not been kind to plaintiffs like Ruth L. Frank. But still, it does mean the fight for voting rights goes on, and every victory is still a victory. All right, last here, uh, filing this under good news, but which really should get an award for cleverness in making the heads of right-wingers explode. The United Church of Christ, along with a coalition of clergy members, has filed a federal lawsuit against the state of North Carolina, arguing that the state's constitutional ban on same-sex marriage is a violation of their religious freedom. The clergy members said they'd like to be able to for perform same-sex marriages in North Carolina, but they can't because of this unjust law. The Reverend J. Bennett Guess, who's executive minister of the Cleveland-based United Church of Christ, which, by the way, has over a million parishioners, said that, quoting him, North Carolina's marriage laws are a direct affront to freedom of religion. Because, he went on, it is important that any person who comes into the community life of a United Church of Christ congregation be afforded equal pastoral care and equal opportunity to religious services that clergy provide. So you tell him, Rev. Uh, besides the United Church of Christ, a dozen clergy members and some same-sex couples who uh, want to get married in North Carolina were also listed as plaintiffs. As of now, 17 states and the District of Columbia allow for same-sex marriage. Federal judges have struck down bans in Michigan, Utah, Texas, Oklahoma, and Virginia. All of those cases are currently on appeal. All right, moving on from there to one of our occasional features, it's the Hero Award. It's given as the occasion arises to people who simply just do the right thing on a matter big or small. This time, the honor goes to nine-year-old Hector Montoya of Dallas, Texas. Now, you may have heard about this because it's gone sort of viral, but uh, it's still worth noticing and recognizing. Hector had been saving his money for more than a year because he wanted to buy himself a PlayStation 4. But then he heard about a mother and daughter who were killed in a house fire in the nearby community of Grand Prairie, killed because the house lacked a smoke detector. Hector said, that hurt my heart. 
and so it was goodbye PlayStation. Hello, 100 smoke detectors to supply one to every house in that community that didn't have one. The Grand Prairie Fire Department actually helped to install them. Now, it actually turns out that Hector won't have to start saving again from scratch. Two complete strangers so touched by his story that not only did they give him a PlayStation 4, they also gave him $150 to buy more smoke detectors for more houses. So uh, Hector came out of this with his game, uh, game station anyway, but of course he didn't know that going in. What he knew going in was, as he said, saving a life is more important than a game which makes Hector Montoya a hero. All right, we're going to take a break just now. Uh, we're actually, I'm going to tell you now, it's going to be a little bit unusual this week. We are actually not going to do either of our regular features, the Clown Award or the Outrage of the Week, because there's something I want to spend some time on uh, for the rest of the show, and we're going to do that right after we have a quick break. And here we are back. So for the rest of the show, we're going to do we're going to be talking about something kind of different um, because this is show number 157 of Left Side of the Aisle. And those of you that can do a little quick math would realize that that means this is three full years we've been doing this. This is actually the first show of the fourth year. This is our third anniversary show. So having done this now for three years and knowing that there is a, a, a lot of you who have not been watching the show a lot or only watch it occasionally, um, I thought it might be a good time to reintroduce myself as to who I am, where I came from, uh, what my attitudes are so that you can put what you see here into a broader context. And I have to start by talking about a, a, a psychological, philosophical concept called worldview. Your worldview is your way of making sense of the world around you. It's your way to make the world be an ordered place where things make sense. We all have a worldview. Uh, it's difficult, if not impossible, to function without one. Without a worldview, the entire world is constant, confusing chaos. Um, and the thing is, it's not only people that have worldviews. Cult uh, cultures have worldviews. In fact, one of the things that defines a culture is having a generally shared worldview, a generally shared sort of baseline understanding of the way reality operates. Uh, what that worldview is can vary culture to culture. It, within a culture, it can vary dramatically over time. Uh, for example, the, the worldview that we now have uh, in this country is dramatically different than the worldview at the time of, let's say, at the time of the European settlement of North America. Um, and that actually applies, that difference, change in worldview over those couple of hundred years applies both to the Europeans who settled here uh, and, uh, and their descendants lived here since, and to the natives as well, to Native Americans as well. Our sense of how the world works is just different than it was. Now, within your personal worldview, there is a more limited sense of the worldview. Uh, this is your worldview as it applies to political, ethical, moral considerations. It's your sense of right and wrong, good and bad, uh, proper and improper, what should be and what shouldn't be. It's um, how your worldview um, affects, drives, uh, um, informs your ethical sense. Now, for most people, now, people's worldviews can change, but for most people, once that worldview is formed, uh, usually it doesn't change. It can, usually it doesn't change, at least not very much. So, what I want to do is kind of lay out to you how my worldview was formed, my ethical worldview was formed, how it reached its, what you might call its mature form. I am, in many ways, a child of the 60s, the, the dreaded 60s. Having come to, uh, I came to political awareness during that brief and some would have it mythical interregnum, marked at one end by the Sgt. Pepper Summer and the other by Altamont, or if you pr prefer political descriptions, by Flower Power and the Days of Rage. Now, for those of you under about the age of 55, to whom those terms don't mean anything at all, you can look them up. But uh, note for the time now that we're really talking about a period of about 1967 to 1970, about that period. 
like most, at least most male members of my generation, the thing that uh, initially drew me from vague concern to outright political involvement was the Vietnam War. Because even if those, uh, for those of us safe with draft deferments, and again, something people now just, you know, sometimes don't relate to, there was a military draft. You could be required under pain of imprisonment to join the army and go wherever they sent you. But even for those of us who had draft deferments, who didn't really expect to be drafted, the fact is the war was always there. It swirled around us like a mist or a fog. It tugged at us like an undertow. It was always there, threaded in and out of our consciousness, consciousnesses. Um, the only way you actually ignored the war was by consciously deciding to. You could not avoid the war. And in fact, because of that, because of the impact the war had on my generation, I think that those of us of the Vietnam era understand more the impact that World War II had on our parents than those of what we might call the Iraq generation understand about Vietnam. Because pretty much, no matter how you put it, Vietnam, really the Indochina War is what it really was, was a much bigger war than Iraq ever was. Um, consider that the peak troop strength in Iraq, U.S. troop strength in Iraq, was 168,000. In Vietnam, it was 536,000, more than three times as much. The number of Americans, American soldiers, killed in Iraq, who died in the Iraq War, 4,486. The number who were killed in the Indochina War, 58,220, 13 times as many. We did not measure, count the deaths in terms of ones and tens and dozens. We counted them by the hundreds. It simply was a far bigger war. Not as big as World War II, but still much bigger. Uh, orders of magnitude bigger than, um, than Iraq ever was. And the point is, those of us who were living through that time, who were seeing that war, who recognized the wrongness of that war, we kept asking about the whens, the wherefores, the whys in the war, and the problem is every government answer our government offered seemed just to raise two new questions. Now, I had been to that time uh, what I came to call later a right-wing liberal. Today, we usually call them liberal war hawks. Uh, it's a species of American political animal that's clearly liberal on domestic policy and clearly conservative on foreign affairs. It's a type whose philosophy I later summed up as hooray for justice, beauty, truth, and kill commies. Now, my personal breakpoint uh, with regard to Vietnam came when I heard the commander of the troops in Vietnam at one point. I don't remember which one, Westmoreland Abrams, I don't remember which one it was. But one of them said, we're winning the war. Just give us six more months. Just give us six more months. And I clearly remembered having heard exactly the same thing six months earlier. So that was my break point. Especially as the war, of course, did drag on, not for six months, but for year after year, amid repeated promises that it actually was already over. Now that sort of, for lack of a better term, alienation, uh, plus the mounting evidence of what the governments we were supporting in South Vietnam were really like, eventually prompted me to, very shyly, join a local peace group. Uh, that was, in the, if memory serves, in the fall of 1968. In fact, I still can remember walking into this room in the basement of a church and being welcomed by this very tall man with a beard and a not inconsiderable resemblance to Abraham Lincoln. In fact, he later grew a mustache because he was tired of the Lincoln jokes. All right, anyway, you can relax. This is over. I'm not going to inflict my autobiography on you. That's as far as we're going. The point is, noting the roots of my involvement in political action may help to explain to some extent where I've wound up. I'm an aging hippie, an educator, and a political activist. The terms order of presentation depending upon circumstances and my mood of the moment. I'm also a democratic socialist green with an anarchist bent and a civil liberties absolutist who has, as both by both logical conclusion and moral conviction, a commitment to active nonviolence, both as political tactic and way of living. The only isms I wholeheartedly endorse are skepticism and eclecticism. In fact, I have jokingly, on more than one occasion, referred to myself as a socialist, anarchist, communalist, capitalist, eclecticist, iconoclast. And after people's eyes sort of glaze over, 
I proceed to explain it. I'm a capitalist in the sense that I believe in the mom and pot store, the local business, the small factory, the small chain, a couple of stores and that. I'm a communalist and then I believe that cooperative ventures are better, inherently better than competitive ones, both for the community at large and for the people involved. I'm a socialist in that I believe that beyond a certain size, profit-seeking enterprises cannot be trusted to be responsible to the communities in which they operate, at which point the community as a whole has the right and the responsibility to step in and start setting rules and exercising control up to and including taking ownership. I'm an anarchist and I believe in doing that with the least government possible and with individual freedom and civil liberties being at the maximum possible consistent with social justice. I'm an eclecticist and I believe you actually can put all of that together to some reasonably coherent political philosophy and I'm an iconoclast in that well, you, you, you may have heard um, of, the, of the I Ching, uh, or the Yi Jing is what it's actually about, but it, the, the, the I Ching, you may have seen it as. Um, the philosophy of that is the only thing that doesn't change is the fact that everything else changes. My version of that is the only ultimate answer is that there is no other ultimate answer. And if we ever built a society along the lines that I envision, the first thing I would do is to try to figure out what's wrong with that society and how it could be improved. In doing the show, I'm guided by four editorial principles. One, to thine own self be true, which is a quote from Shakespeare, as I'm sure you know. Two, the U.S. isn't the worst, but it is the biggest. That's from Joan Baez. Three, sometimes a bit of humor contains more inner truth than the most serious seriousness. And that's a quote from a chess grandmaster named Aaron Nimsovich. And finally, no one but no one, no matter their ideology, political perspective, or status as left or right, revolutionary or counter-revolutionary, can be, by that reason, exempt from either criticism or praise. And that's from me. Thing is, I've always believed that in any political movement, everyone has some skill that they can use, some skill that they can contribute. My skill happens to be words. Writing, talking, giving speeches, and like that. So this show, ultimately, ultimately, what this show is, is just another way I think I can be of use. It's another way to try to advance the cause of justice. Another way uh, to try to maintain hope for the future. To maintain that hope that uh, things not only should be, but can be better. Um, You could think of this show, if you like, as another candle in the rain. Now, I have to say, too, that I have been helped so much over this time, over these past couple of years, by several people without who this simply would not have gone as far as it has. In fact, it probably wouldn't have even gotten started at all. Uh, As we continue on with the show, and hopefully it will continue on for some time to come, uh, these are the people who have helped me get this far. The the first one I have to to, uh, thank is Donna, who... (laughs) Just for being Donna, I mean, that's um, my strength, my focus, my, uh, my reason to get up in the morning. Um, second, uh, Matt Willette, who has since gone on to bigger and better things than, than uh, CCAT, but uh, he did the original graphics for the show, some of which we still use. Uh, Will McKinney. Cameraman and video e- editor extraordinaire of Song and Fable. And uh, Rich Goulart, who is the executive director of CCAT and the all-around go-to guy here, who was willing to take a chance on me. Because when I, when I first approached him about the idea of doing a weekly show of political commentary, one that I flippantly described as a left-wing Glenn Beck minus the chalkboard and paranoia, Hey, I could tell wasn't too sure that this was not going to peter out after a few weeks. But he took the chance and let me do, do it the way I wanted to do it. Let me do it the half hour a week. And um, I hope in the time since he's been given enough cause to be happy with the decision he made. There have been some changes in the show over the time. We've developed a couple of regular features. The Clown Award, which is given for meritorious stupidity, and originally was supposed to not be a regular award, but there's been enough stupidity to keep it going. Plus, of course, the Outrage of the Week. 
and we have developed some occasional features such as the hero award which you saw earlier uh, everything you need to know which is where you can learn a lot about something in just a couple of sentences um, the little thing which is where some passing reference in a news article actually points to something significant that people aren't paying enough attention to and another thing which is uh, for fun science stuff uh, we do updates on, on previous stories and of course our frequent feature happily frequent feature good news when the show started it was just me standing in front of a gray background uh, after a time to keep the people working the cameras from going insane trying to follow me as I sort of wandered around the stage as I talked uh, we went to me sitting on a stool but Later on from there, I, I, I just was more comfortable standing. I was just more comfortable standing. So there I was, I was leaning on a podium in front of that same gray background, which, you know, seemed to make everybody happy. Uh, I was happy because I was standing and the people on the camera were happy because I was standing in one place. Then it got to be fun because then we we're able to use the green screen. It's technically called chroma key, but it's popularly known as green screen. And this is where you can substitute graphics for a background. Here, here in the studio where I'm sitting, what's behind me is just a green painted wall, just a wall, just blank wall painted green. But we can change that background with any graphic we want to put on it. And so we're able to do a lot more eye candy, a lot more nice stuff too. So that's been great to have. Um, I was still at the podium at the time. Uh, I figured, what more, what more could I ask? I had me, I had my podium, I had the graphics, everybody was happy. What more could I ask? Then last fall I blew out my knee and I was on crutches and I could not stand to do the show. So we started doing the desk thing and after a few weeks I decided I like this. So that's what we've got for now and that's what we're doing for now um, that's the look we have for now but I have to tr say that uh, don't, be don't be shocked if at some point you see me standing up again so that's really it uh, I just wanted to um, reintroduce myself to you and to let you know again who I am and of course again always if you have any comments questions reactions please email me Again, it's hooviating at AOL.com or Lotus Surviving a Dark Time is the website. Um, I wanted to thank all of those people who have been helped to me. I wanted to thank any of you who have watched. I know some of you do. Um, I wanted to thank you for your responses. Thank you for any comments you've made. Uh, I look forward to, to more comments and more responses. Um, and I also want to take this last minute to thank just CCAT in general. Uh, and community television in general for giving this option, giving this opportunity to people like me to have their say, to do their part, to try to advance their beliefs. So I will also say to you that if you want to do a show, it doesn't have to be political, it can be about a hobby, uh, it can be about your political beliefs, it can be pretty much anything that you're interested in doing. Come on down here um, and uh, check us out check out CCAT. They will help you get this show on the air. They will help you do the show in every way they possibly can. This is community television. It's for you to use. I would encourage you to do it. I did. You should too. So with that, we're going to take our leave. We're going to see you again next week. But for the moment, you have the best week you possibly can. And peace.